Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow for many people. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Dr. Sarita Mahanti, who is currently the President and Chief Executive Officer of the SCAN Foundation, uh, which is one of the largest foundations in the United States focused specifically on improving the quality of health and life for older adults. Uh, its mission is ultimately to advance a coordinated and easily navigated system of high quality services for older adults to help preserve dignity and their independence. And the foundation uh, was created as an independent charitable organization back in 2008 uh, through a, a $205 million one-time contribution from the uh, nonprofit Scan Health Plan, which is a, a not-for-profit Medicare Advantage plan uh, based in Long Beach, California. Uh, previously, Dr. Mahanti served as the Vice President of Care Coordination for Medicaid and Vulnerable Populations at Kaiser Permanente, uh, as an Assistant Professor of Medicine uh, at USC, as Chief Medical Officer of Cope Health Solutions, which is a healthcare management consulting company and Senior Director at LA Care, the largest U.S. public health plan. Uh, Dr. Mahanti completed her internal medicine residency at Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center and Research Fellowship at Harvard Medical School. She got her MD from Boston University, her Master's in Public Health from Harvard, and her MBA from UCLA. Uh, she completed her undergraduate work at UC Berkeley. Uh, and she currently also, in addition to these responsibilities, serves as an associate professor uh, at the Kaiser Permanente uh, Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine, uh, as well as practices internal medicine uh, with Kaiser Permanente. A lot of very interesting topics to get into her uh, with her today. Uh, Dr. Sarita Monti, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Well, thank you so much, Ira. It's really a pleasure, and um, I thank you for that kind introduction. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's great um, uh, to have you. I I really uh, was impressed by, by your background. And, and as we typically do on the show, I would like to really start off by handing things really to you to talk a little bit more about you. Uh, everything from uh, where you grew up, sort of your development, you have you know, a broad interest in, in biochemistry and molecular biology, studies an undergraduate, into medicine, into public health. Take us a little bit on that early journey, if you would. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I mean, as you probably, as you described my background and as I think about it, it you know, you could say it's it's been somewhat a circuitous uh, route, but there was intention and in how I got to where I am today. Uh, I think fundamentally, if I look at like wh why I'm where I am and the journey I, I've taken, it's really because I have um, tried to be an advocate and I, I see myself as an advocate for those kind of most in need, most vulnerable, um, you know, and I do this by being a physician, by being a systems executive, a ch I, want, I see myself as a change agent, a champion for health equity. So, you know, if I go back and trace my steps, you know, I can see my the roots of my advocacy and being a change agent, agent for those with most unmet need. Um, they link to actually to my some of my personal experiences, uh, and my own even experience with discrimination and not getting the help and support I needed early in my life to start in my childhood. So I grew up in a, a small town in Southern California that was pretty homogenous, uh, not a lot of diversity. You know, you can imagine this like a nine year old Indian girl with braids sitting in a classroom, horn rimmed gla rim glasses. Um, you know, uh, too big for my face. I was chubby, um, and and you know, it made me stand out. And I was a target of ridicule and jokes at school. So, 
you know, kind of looking at that experience. And then I experienced some discrimination in, in, in home, beginning you know, with my color of my skin. You know, I had color, I, I witnessed colorism or experienced colorism in even in my own community because I was darker. So my own ethnicity, my group of um, South Asians discriminated against me a bit. And so mm -hmm. I'm just giving you some context of how I kind of, my, I, my personal experiences impacted kind of how I became this advocate for change. And my solution to overcoming discrimination um, in different areas of my life and finding a path forward was to kind of put all of my energy being super successful academically. So then I, you know, went to high school, did, you know, became you know, valedictorian and then accepted. I went to UC Berkeley and I graduated from Berkeley with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry, molecular biology, because I love science. I was good at it. And I, you know, I ended up going to um, medical school to become a doctor. And then I, like you said, I got my master's in public in public health and business administration. You know, and as I think about my path, I'll just say briefly, you know, I couldn't, as a physician, um, I love practicing medicine. However, I found that there, despite, that I saw a lot of challenges with the existing system. And I felt like there was more, certainly I wanted to practice, but I also felt like I wanted to make some real substantive changes in the way system was 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 happening or you know uh, functioning and so that was one thing you know the uh, masters in public health i think there was this opportunity to say how can we prevent disease prolong life promote health um how can we organize with other systems and players in the field and i the public health really talked really taught me about community um, the, the role of public and private partnerships. So that was really kind of um, an opportunity and research. And I, I, I became a health services researcher for a period of time to study some of the problems that were faced in our healthcare system. And then the MBA was just because I was like, we are not sustaining models. Um, there are economic forces that come into play to make change in the, in the system. So how do we build business cases? And I think the MBA was an opportunity for me to really start to understand the how, you know, we are a capitalist society. How do we think about business aspect of health and healthcare? So I think um, that gives you kind of a, a sense of where, how I kind of came to be. And, um, you know, I, I have a lot of stories, you know, I, I, I like to share like a story of, you know, of a clinic patient mm -hmm. um, and we'll call him Joey. He helped me really define my mission to improve the health and well-being. Uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable, underserved populations, including older adults. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe's 66. You know, he was he he was homeless. He was a substance abuser. Had zero family or social support. And he came to our clinic one day, and we ultimately diagnosed him um, through a team effort to that he had uh, a head and neck cancer. And mm -hmm. but what I witnessed, and this is I have thousands of stories about this. In addition to the medical care. Joe needed help navigating the healthcare system. He didn't understand it. He needed kindness and compassion mm -hmm. uh, as he dealt with his cancer. Um, I also realized at that point and many points afterwards that there was more to health than the medical and the clinical. There were these social factors influencing health. And so when you hear from me, you'll hear about the whole, I don't say health care because it's about total health or mm -hmm. whole person care, which encompasses the physical, the behavioral, the social, the spiritual. And I think when we think about being making people healthy, we have to we have to look at all those factors. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate bringing that up. And I, I'm, I'm going to enjoy it in a little bit when we get into sort of the issues with the, the California Master Plan for Aging and, and some of your recent uh, you know, recent articles where you focus on equity and, and the social determinants and so forth. So I'm, I'm going to enjoy I, I appreciate you sort of laying the groundwork for all that. Um, you know, I, I thought I always sort of Go, to dive in and sort of swim through our guest um, uh, publications in, in the peer-reviewed literature over the, over the and, and you have quite a few uh, over the last couple of decades just to sort of again um, sort of lay the groundwork for the audience, but also really highlight why you know 
as you, as we get to your current role at Scan, you know, you're perfect for <laughs> for what you're doing now. And I thought a couple interesting places to go, and, and these sort of interestingly line up with some of the uh, baskets of uh, uh, you know focus of the Scan Foundation would be to um, uh, initially some of your work, you know, uh, when you were back at uh, Cedar Sinai. Uh, you published a series of, of papers in uh, the Journal of Palliative Medicine over a couple of years where you were doing uh, studies, uh, yeah. initially in recruitment, but then looking at patient reflections and emergency medicine physician perspectives on palliative care in mm -hmm. an emergency department, which I found fascinating because you were, you were we don't really think uh, sort of... And, end of life care in the emergency department and these this component we think emergency physician you know we, we got to take care of this current situation right here less or so the palliative care aspect talk a little bit about this this period from 2009 to 2011 when you were recruiting and doing this study because i think it's a really interesting example of of, of a, a domain that you've been involved in yeah no this was a I mean, again this was not something i had you know but I, I didn't know that I was going to kind of look into this this kind of area of, of health, which was palliative care, because back in 2008, as you said, or even before, when I started at USC, actually, in 2004, we weren't talking about palliative care. I wasn't yeah. trained as a physician about palliative care, which is the care that people need at the end of life. And it doesn't always mean hospice. It means... Yeah you know, pain control and controlling of your nausea and other symptoms and, and having the social supports that you need or supports in the home and the, to be able to, you know, live with dignity and independence, even in the later stages of your life. And so um, there was this article that uh, I, so I, well, first of all, I should say I worked with a physician um, who eventually did go to Cedar sinai So I wasn't there, but she was, her name was Dr. Susan Stone okay. and um, another woman named Dr. Karitza Grutzen. They were both emergency, they're both emergency physicians. And I witnessed, as I, I, as I, I say this a lot, um, an, Every day I'd walk in the county hospital, you know, LA County USC Medical Center, the second largest public hospital in the country, serving safety net at that time, mostly uninsured because we didn't have the Affordable Care Act. So we, we had less people on Medicaid at that time. Uh, so we saw majority low income people, com communities of color receiving their care in the emergency department, yep. especially and including, and especially we started to see this uptick, and it was just probably always there, of those who are at the end of life. So they had advanced cancer diagnosed, and a lot of times it was because they never got enough uh, preventive care or ongoing care. So they, by the time they were diagnosed, it was already, they were like in stage four of their cancer. So you would see them dealing with debilitation, chronic advanced illness. And so in my in this partnership with Dr. Stone and Dr. Grutzen, uh, we looked at patients' perceptions of illness and who presented to the emergency department at the end of life. And what we found was that they, ten they tended to come to the emergency department when pain was most out of control. Mm -hmm. So they, they needed pain control, they couldn't get pain control, so they, that's where they came. Um, and this was the county served mostly um, communities of color, uh, Latinos and and African Americans, and there was a lot of racial ethnic disparities that we witnessed um, in the receipt of palliative care services. Now that could be cultural, that could be um, you know because there there was maybe not that receptivity, or they didn't understand what palliative care meant. Mm -hmm. So um, what we learned, and, and I started doing this more in my work, was the emergency department is actually a an important environment, a place to actually study vulnerable populations because oftentimes those ones who lack resources or you know, don't have the cultural sensitivity of care. They they use the emergency department as their last resort. So that was that was one um, really important area. And and you know, Dr. Stone actually just I would like to call her out. She actually created the first palliative care program for County USC um, that really kind of now is has sustained and grown. And now you hear about the role of supportive or palliative care across the country as an important part of end of life services. Yeah. And, 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 you know, along those lines, sort mm -hmm. of at the, at the same time, your um, yeah. Cope Health in 2010 
a, a similar presentation you gave at the uh, American Public Health Association uh, that year on community-based research to reduce non-urgent use of pediatric emergency care. Yeah. Say a couple words about that as well, because we're now we're focused at the other the other end of life yeah. here. But say, say a couple words on that one. Too, yeah, and and I think this was the same. Like you know, again, how do we ensure that people people in this case we looked at I looked with a, another set of researchers on um, on um, the pediatric side because we were having the same challenges I mean adults it was all the whole spectrum I mean and uh, so what were the things that could be done to avoid or um, you know mitigate people um, and our parents bringing their kids into the emergency department for things like asthma mm -hmm. you know that that really could should be non-urgent because they you know if you have the proper medications you can get them you know they don't have to show up in the emergency department with acute exacerbations and and so we 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 looked at this and in, in the studies that we looked at was community-based support so for example education um, with use of community health workers to go into the homes to be able to say all right um you know well a couple of things one checking the environment to make sure that there was, you know, they weren't dealing with the triggers that would impact in this case, like asthma. And, you know, so preventative education, and then also how to get your medications and why those medications are important so that you're not having to go then to the emergency department or even just preventive care, like getting your, your annual wellness visit as a, pedi pedi uh, as a kid, you know, what, are the, what does that mean and why is it important? So those were the community-based solutions that we were, we were seeking. And again, because we were seeing this, this over-reliance on the emergency department, as a source of primary care. And so that was that theme. You could see I was emerging in my mind and my, you know, my, my thinking, like we got to get away from institutionalization of care. We got to be thinking more about care in the home, in the community, um, obviously preventive care, public health being a key, a key focus. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, let's, uh, Move now towards the SCAN Foundation. I, I, as I mentioned in the intro, created a sort of this independent mm -hmm. organization back about 14 years ago, $205 million contribution from the, the core SCAN uh, health plan. That's part of a, something called the SCAN group nowadays, but mm -hmm. um, it's a Medicare Advantage organization. Uh, take us a, into a little bit of the history of this. You know, obviously, I think I know why elder care and, and so forth is important, but what was the genesis of uh, this specific uh, plan to set up this organization back in 2008? So it takes a little bit on that story, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the SCAN Health Plan, as you mentioned, was the entity that offered this one-time in kind of endowment for, to set up this, this public charity, the SCAN Foundation, back in 2008. And and the the impetus was well. First of all, um, Scan Health Plan is a Medicare Advantage plan, and they're they're a not for profit. Their mission is to you know improve the lives of older adults and support the lives of older adults. Um, giving given that they focus on Medicare eligible uh, beneficiaries, and um, so the the foundation was created, and it was really to. Uh, to really uh, serve uh, older adults and 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 offer, pro, you know, uh, support for programs and others other things that would make an impact on the lives of older adults. So, so that's how it was created. Now, Scan Health Plan. If you look at the history, you know that was also created by a a group of seniors who came together and said they call it the social. Health ma maintenance organization or social the SMO or SMO mm -hmm. social HMO, and they came together because they were like, we want a healthcare system that is, you know, supporting us and is person centered. And so this these con what we, the the foundation really was about is being creating um, you know, with dignity and independent solutions that allow uh, older adults to have person centered care. And what do I mean by that is that you are again taking the preferences and the needs and the wants of the older adult into account when you're versus saying here's what we you need do it yep. because you might say to somebody 
okay, take your diabetic medication, your insulin or your metformin, and they're going to be saying, well, I can't take insulin because I don't have a refrigerator in my house. Mm-hmm. Or, um, well, I have competing priorities because I got to pay my bills or, you know, I, I, I want to, I don't want to take these medications. And, you know, you, and so being able to understand what they, what drives them is really important. So that was the impetus for creating this foundation. And over the years, the Scan Foundation has really uh, been really focused on, um, you know, having a more easily navigated system of care. So what I mean by the, the right now, the system is really complex, yeah. really difficult to navigate. Um, people can't understand if they have Medicare and, and they have Medicaid, for example, how those coordinate. They don't. They they often get mul- multiple calls from different care management programs, et cetera. So there's a lot of complexity that it's still, you know, so we're, we're, we're trying to co- create this um, help support in the creation of seamless navigation. Uh, the other thing is we're more focused on macro system level changes. Yep. So programs and policies to improve care for older adults. So what are the financing policies that need to be in place to allow older adults to age in place? So, um, and so to the extent that we can help support programs also that have the ability to scale and be mm-hmm. sustainable, that's what we, we, we are, um, you know, our, that's what the foundation has, has been doing. And we have a number of examples of things of policies, you know, we were, the, the SCAN Foundation was instrumental in the 2018 development of the Chronic Care Act. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and also, like recently, more recently in the last few years, there's these supplemental benefits for Medicare Advantage called it's called SSBCIs, uh, special supplemental benefits for chronically ill, where now Medicare Advantage plans can offer benefits that uh, help support social needs, mm. like like they may want to give um, an individual a air conditioner or certain type of things that will help, you know, or even food, uh, medically tailored meals that can is now more incentivized through this, this SSBCI. So that's an, those are some examples of what we have aimed to do. So that is, and, and our goal is to continue to advance those policies. And, you know, I can get into the fact that we are now um, taking a much stronger stance and, um, action around health equity in, in aging as well. And also, how do we bring innovation more to the forefront and, and actually even partner with private capital um, and venture, meaning we can be investors, we can be at the table, how do we bring, bring private capital with policymakers to say we're all trying to solve certain problems, how do we, how do, we do those collectively? So those are some of the things, because we are all aging, Yep. You know, and um, because and and goes back to my own purpose that you know that I want to sir improve the health and well being of vulnerable populations and the aging, the, the advancing those that are advancing in aging um, are are vulnerable and we need to support them in the best way possible. Outstanding, really outstanding. So yeah, I mean, let's let's do a little bit of a deeper dive now into some of these areas of focus that you just mentioned and you and highlighted it. You have these real sort of these three core segments uh, of focus, driving the, the responsible financing policies, the, the resilience and innovation, and then the transformation of care. Um, and, and I think a, a sort of a, a, an important and sort of sobering place to start uh, would be in sort of the the area of financing policies in this mm-hmm. report that you uh, you recently uh, funded. It was uh, done in, in collaboration with the uh, uh, National Opinion Research Center, University of Chicago, using University of Michigan uh, health and retirement data. <laughs> Conclusion, sobering enough, 11 million middle income seniors by the year 2033 unable to afford long-term care. Um, this is a problem. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of what, what, sort of when you initiated this study and a little bit of, I mean, I'm sure this is a surprising conclusion, but uh, what were you looking for when you first sort of got into this research and and, and talk a little bit about sort of uh, the analysis when, when you first took a look at it? Because it's... Yeah, it's yeah, I, yeah, I mean, again, I think, you know, fundamentally, you know, first of all, big recon- I mean, obviously recognition that the the population, the age, the demographics are shifting, yeah. right? So first and foremost, you know, that we are, you know, older adults are the fastest growing segment of, of our population. I mean, there's statistics that show that by 2035, 
the U.S. will have more adults than children. Uh, people are living longer. And, you know, in California, we have a statistic that, you know, age 65 plus will increase to more than 9 million by 2030. That's 20, that, that's 20 times the growth rate of those younger than 65. So, you know, so we're like, we're recognizing, so there are, you know, old, older adults on the, you know, more and more of them, right? We know, and we're all aging, we're all aging, right? And then we, then there was the COVID pandemic, you know, the pandemic, and it kind of turned us upside down. We witnessed this devastating impact on aging and aging loved ones. Um, and we saw that like 75, more than 75% of those who died from the coronavirus were actually in California had been over 65. So we saw that we saw, um, and so to get answer your question about this study, in that vein, we it was then the COVID pandemic kind of really shed light on this, that people were um, that they were they were facing a lot of challenges in accessing supports for community living. Okay, that people you know um, the demands for long term services and supports, healthcare, affordable, accessible housing and transportation were all increasing. And you know you you kind of mentioned you know like we know like. The, 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 those numbers that over 11 million, right? More than 70% of, of, of Americans age 65 and older will need long-term services and supports at some point, okay? And half turning 65 today will need a high level of help with basic activities like eating and bathing. Um, so, so that was the impetus. Like when we started to do this analysis to say we... Um, we we have to um, we have to recognize that we don't have all the systems in place yeah. to be able to get to 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 accommodate to really support this this growing demographic and the needs of long term services supports and this includes their like I said activities of daily living and yeah. um, basic things and um, and you know the other thing we found in our some of our analyses was that. 88% of U.S. adults actually would prefer to, to receive ongoing, I would say, living assistance at home or with a loved one in, in what was described as intergenerational homes. They would, uh, but they can't afford it. And that's, that, was the, that was the piece that um, also was resonating, was that the majority could not afford and access the services they needed. So that was really, and then my last thing I'll just say, I think it's just kind of important, you know, we, we also do polling with, um, and to kind of see what the voters are thinking, you know, as so we've commissioned polling um, of voters, Democrats and Republicans alike, and we find um, that collectively they want change. And there was actually even a, a, a survey that we did last year that of a thousand California voters in 2021, it was like a, a near super majority, 65% said that the pandemic has made it more urgent to address a range of issues like um, where, where, and that includes the um, aging at home and community. Yeah. So that, that really kind of, I think, Kind of, tip, you know, kind of gives you an example of of where where we're continuing. We're we're, we're in a crisis. I, I want to just say that we are in a in a crisis right now because we could go into these topics, but the challenges is right now there is not enough workforce to support people in the home. People are leaving like home or healthcare agencies in droves to go work and like at the internet and and Amazon other places because you know there's not the the financial necessarily incentive. You know, you have unpaid caregivers, like family members, like myself, caring for their their parents, um, who are, um, you know, how do you balance that if you're, you're, you know, and especially if you're lower income and you have two jobs and you have to care give. So right. there's a lot of challenges we're we're dealing with that we need to address. C connected with that whole concept of of um, aging in place, aging in the home 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 care smart mm -hmm. home health care um and and, and once again coming back to sort of the, the, one of the scan missions of, of transforming care and, and delivery um another article that i you know i saw you quoted recently had to do with extending uh something on like the acute hospital care at home program beyond covid mm -hmm. um can you talk a little bit about because the principle of hospital care at home we've gotten into on the show, and it's been very okay. interesting yeah. to see organizations like Best Buy, mm -hmm. right, go buy my computer in stereo, getting into the, uh, yeah. I don't buy stereos anymore, <laughs> my computer, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, getting into this business, uh, General Electric, uh, uh -huh. thinking about how to build smart health homes, smart healthy homes 
Talk a little bit about the acute hospital care at home program, if you would, and, and sort of where we are with that from a implementation policy perspective in terms of extending it. Yeah, no, it's um, and I, you know, like you said, I had I had an opportunity to kind of be involved in some conversations about hospital at home and acute care at home uh, with some um entities like Kaiser Permanente, Mayo Clinic, others who are really trying to advance uh, this, this model. And you know, I've done some great work because, you know, clearly if there are ways to set up systems uh, in the home to allow people to not have to sit in the hospital for days on end, um, you know, they, where they can get some of that like I, IV um, intravenous antibiotics and, and, you know, you know, other things that could be done, that, that is a, great opportunity. That being said, I think one of the things, um, you know, there's a couple of things that come up about that hospital at home model, which is one is um, it is is labor intensive because you still have to have nursing oversight and support in those homes. And, you know, typically a physician doesn't necessarily have to be in the home, but they would have to be available. So you have somebody who's kind of overseeing the process, particularly if something complex happens. The other piece is, you know, what other, like, wh what's the burden on the family? Um, if it, you know, it could be, it could be an advantage to a family member to have a, the person at home versus in the hospital, but it, sometimes it could be harder for them because now, you know, a nurse might come in and say, okay, daughter of this patient who just got discharged from the hospital, you are going to now be responsible for flushing that that line, that that intravenous, as we call the pick line, to give them that, you know, and now you're asking somebody to take on more responsibility, which puts a lot of burden at times, burnout, um, other things, like I said, if you're working two jobs, and you got to, how do you manage that? So I think, you know, it has has um, real opportunity, but you have to take into account the circumstances of the, the person and the family. Uh, so not everything, it can't be as cookie cutter as we want. And, and we also have to recognize like in lower income communities, community, you know, it, it may not be as easy to set up these hospital at home models. And we, so we talked about that with, you know, the, the leaders and these uh, the other organizations to say, um, and, you know, also the other thing is like in the hospital at home, how are we making sure that their social supports are being addressed? You know, so, uh, you know, are they getting the food they need? Are they getting the transportation if they have to have visits? You know, there, there, somebody needs to be able to coordinate that. And I think, like I know with Kaiser Permanente, for example, they are making sure that there's like social work, uh, yep. you know, tied to that and other, um, you know, uh, like workers that could support uh, individuals in case they need those non-medical help as well. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an emerging. And I think to go to your, I think you did ask about incentives and there is definitely some um, now in, uh, you know, work that is going on to, to, to reimburse more for these hospital at home models, given some of the proven impacts that we're seeing um, in terms of reducing readmissions, you know, people keep in sat patient satisfaction. So more, more to come on the, the role of hospital at home, but I think it is, I think we're going to see more of it, but just have to tailor it, you know, in a person-centered way. Got it. Got yeah. It. Um, going to sort of the the third basket uh, that that um, Scan mentions, the sort of building of resilience and capacity, and 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 you operating as you were mentioning in the in your intro, uh, maybe not like a venture fund, maybe a venture philanthropy, mm -hmm. but sort of investing in this next generation of innovators combined with um, bringing older adults to the table and not just making stuff for them, but with them, as you were saying. Um, in addition to sort of the aging in place concepts, we've also, you know, had done a lot of shows on, on sort of two other segments, uh, namely age tech, uh, sort of all the wearables and the yeah. smartphone stuff uh, that, that can help. Uh, you know, the um, uh, Melinda Gates organization is, is very hot on this. We had, uh, uh, they were uh, an investor with the Techstars program, and they were recently on talking about some of these uh, new tools that help sort of the unpaid uh, uh age care workers uh, mm -hmm. in their duties. And then sort of a third segment of that, um, this what we'll call zero science. You, you brought up uh, metformin before uh, when you were talking about uh, diabetes care, but there, you know, here's an area where, you know, there's also companies we're talking to that, you know, uh, how we bio, bio biomedically uh, try to make 85, 75 and so forth. Uh, talk a little bit about 
uh, what you look at in terms of your own uh, venture investment portfolio there at SCAN, but also what, what are you personally interested in? What gets you excited in some, some, some of these new technologies and, and uh, services that are coming down the, uh, the pipeline maybe in the next five, 10 years? Yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm really actually excited. I mean, you know, and I've had a chance to listen into some of your your um, your uh, talks with with Age Tech and 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 you know the Melinda Gates, um, you know, and all of the work that they're doing. And we we follow that and we we engage with them um, pretty closely just to to kind of see what is out there. Um, and and certainly, I think in our next iteration, like the I would say the next phase of the Scan Foundation, we are going to really pursue opportunities um, to to kind of to to directly to invest and also to help foster innovation and in aging um, specifically for those with that have maybe more unmet need and need more choice and solutions products and services to help them like in the home into age in place and um, because we've seen you know, like you said breakthroughs in the private sector there's a lot of cross-sector collaboration, um, public-private partnerships that are driving kind of what I would think is more the most impactful and innovative or um, um, change, I would say, for older adults. So that's why it's it's really kind of something that really excites me, excites our foundation. Um, and we want to make sure that we have scalable solutions. I think one of the fundamental challenges I've faced or witnessed is that a lot of our, the solutions we see are, they're not scaling. Um, they're just like they're they're pilots, and then they just kind of go, and then they don't they don't go to the next community or the next state, and um, and 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 again, not not also being scaled equitably. Mm -hmm. And so so to answer, so we are really on this journey to um, uh, as a foundation. So we're gonna you know we want to broaden our audience as a foundation by reaching new organizations, you know their experiences, their perspectives, including the private sector. Uh, and you know, and 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 expand our work in innovation. You know, creating new opportunities. You know, to so we have a corpus. You know, how do we take that corpus? How do we invest some of those dollars in what we call social impact investing? You know, mm. how do we how do we um, say okay, we want to we we need to see a, some rate of return, but we all but fundamentally our core principle is to have social impacts in this case focused on areas like. Like I, I would say probably right now, our focus areas will be as we go forward in this tech space, how do we ensure affordability in aging? Mm -hmm. How do we um, support a workforce um, in aging? And what are the tech solutions and um, enablers that can help us get there? Uh, so we're, we're really looking at those um, those options right now. Um, I think it's it's a really great time. I think um, policymakers and um, private capital need to come together to say, what are we all doing in this space? Because we are, like I said earlier, we're in a capitalist society. So um, so we are looking at some of, uh, of those options. I would say we're, we're earlier in our phases um, of, of that. But um, but we also think the other thing I should say is that when we think about, and I know like some of the age tech work that's going on is trying to explore this, but when you're designing products and services mm -hmm. for older adults, you do need to make certain that you design with them. So yeah. a human-centered design, a co-design approach, because what I see in coming from a health plan and others, like oftentimes we say, oh, we know the solution for you. Yeah. So we're going to build it and we're going to, we're going to offer it to you, but it's not again, often person-centered. So we have some real, um, so those are the things we're going to bring to the table and um, hopefully we can change the paradigm. Uh, by bringing private and public together. That's outstanding. Really awesome. Um, let's go now. We, we talked, you know, a lot about these different themes, but I would love now to uh, bring them all together and uh, in, in, in sort of point back to your uh, guest commentary from last year in Cal Matters, where you wrote this piece, The Future of Aging in California Requires Investment and Equity. Um, and we talked about both of these, but now with a specific focus beyond scan towards the, the grander master plan for aging in California. Um, last year, I, was, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Shelly Lightford at the, at the mm -hmm. West House Group. She introduced us a little bit to, to uh, the master plan, but what are you involved in there? Talk a little, reintroduce us, please, yeah. and, and a little bit of uh, when 
obviously California is its own country. <laughs> um, uh, talk a little bit about sort of uh, the importance of the master plan, but how SCAN's getting involved there and pushing the concepts of equity and extra investment. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm happy to say we, you know, and it can speak for California and for other states in different level, in different ways, but we, we, we're starting, we have a plan. So, you know, in terms of, and you, you referenced the master plan for aging and, um, and we, um, for years now, the SCAN Foundation and in partnership with Shelley and West Health and other in Archstone Foundation and others in California have been working, we initially was working towards getting a master plan in place. And this is a, a blueprint. Um, it's a 10 year blueprint that says, okay, here are the things we need to do to, to improve aging for all ages, all stages, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, we don't put a 65 plus kind of sticker on it. It's, it's for, you know, all aspects of aging, you know, cause I think I remember you, um, Iron, one of your talks years back, you talk about the different types of age, you know, there's the chronicle logic and then yeah. there's the the, yeah, so I mean, there's different, you know, there, and then there's the physiologic age, right? And right. some people can, a homeless person typically is yep. sometimes, you know, 20 years physiologically older than than somebody else. So anyway, we we were really we really um, we really hone in on that. So anyway, the master plan for aging is that blueprint, and it 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 and we 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 were we were really excited because the governor endorsed and had an executive order last year in um, January of 2021. Uh, that I mean, his announcement that this was going to now be um, a plan for California, and it touches on five core elements um, for real success. And there's so five goals are housing for age, all ages and st all stages. That's the first goal. You know, kind of how do we live where we choose as we age in communities? You know, how do we ensure that they're they support they're age friendly? They they support those with disability. Um, and also, you know, of course, not surprising, we need to be thinking about climate and dis disaster ready mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the first um, thing. And, you know, so it really aligns, of course, you can, when you hear, you hear about the SCAN Foundation, that ability to, to have, be, in, be in, you know, age where you choose is so important. The second one is health reimagined. And we have this ability to access, you know, where we want older adults to access services they need to live at home in their communities and to optimize health and quality of life. That is just like, how do we think about things that we haven't thought about in aging? That's where even I think the private sector work that, you know, we talked about there, there's this creativity and innovation. How do we spur that as we think about health reimagined? So that's the second one. The third one is inclusion and equity, not isolation. Um, so we, there's a lot of ways we can do to make sure that we protect against isolation, discrimination, abuse, neglect, exploiting of older adults. And so how do we think that so the, 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 the state is collectively thinking about how do you think about work for older adults, even after like forced retirement, how can you get them into the workforces because the workforce is getting, you know, we're, we're having a, sh a shortage of, of, of talented workforce and, and we're in a crisis of workforce. How could there be opportunities to, to you know, thrive and live, live with vitality by working, let's say, and what, what are those op options? Volunteering, engagement in the community, leadership. So there's a lot of things. And of course, you know, making sure that we're not, again, discriminating um, we have to combat the racism, the the xenophobia, the the, the uh, ableism uh, around those with disabilities. So there's a lot of things we have to work on in that space. Caregiving that works is the fourth goal, um, and we need to be able to support, you know, have those supports in caregiving. You know, what are those models that are are going to get um, paid and unpaid caregivers, you know, to the point of being able to help those the age in place. And there's going to be some policy, um, um, you know, implications or things that need, need to be done to be able to help support caregivers, who, particularly those who are unpaid, but even the ones that are paid, they're getting paid very little on, on op, oftentimes. And so they're, they're leaving that, that industry in droves. So that's the fourth one. And then affordable aging. And this is a big one, I think, for the even for the foundation that we also feel that we have an opportunity to help, which is how do we get make sure that people have the economic security for as long as they live? So what's happening is, and I we I can I, I want to bring up something that I didn't mention before, but one of the priority populations for the foundation is working on this 
group called the Forgotten Middle. And we yeah. recently commissioned some work around the Forgotten Middle with NORC and, and Chicago. And, yep. and um, it, these are the, the individuals, the, the Forgotten Middle, those individuals who are falling into this kind of gra this gap, excuse me, where they're not qualifying for Medicaid, but they also lack the, the resources um, yep. to pay for housing, long-term care. And so that, and there's this real, this myth, or like, I think this um, lack of understanding that a lot of people still think that Medicare covers long-term care and home mm -hmm. and community-based care. And then when they get Medicare, they, when they need those services, they, re they realize, oh, no, Medicare doesn't cover that at all. Mm -hmm. So it was like a hundred days of service in a, long, in, a, in a nursing facility. That's it. That's what mm -hmm. you get covered for. So we are really, um, that affordability piece is so critical. And that's why we're excited. The master plan included that as one of the goals. Like how do we start getting people earlier in the, you know, like as they're, when they're 40 or 30, how do they start thinking about their, what savings they may need to have to support that gap that they might be in? Unless they have a lot of resources, they're in the upper class or maybe Medicaid, but even Medicaid doesn't have the whole, all the services available, but it has some, it's that forgotten middle if you're in that bucket. Um, so that's the piece that I think is, um, is really exciting. So the master plan, we are helping with other foundations to help the, now the state get to a point of execution on these these five bold goals. Um, so we're, and, and I'm actually over, I'm on part of the committee, the oversight committee called the impact committee for the master plan. So I get the opportunity to work with our our, our, our committee to, to oversee what progress we're making and what, what we can do to support the state. So those are some of the things that are happening. And so there's like 23 strategies and over a hundred and some initiatives in the master plan itself in California. The last thing I'll just say, though, before I forget, is that you talk about California being its own country. Mm -hmm. We are actually um, working with other states now and supporting with, through technical assistance and collaboratives to say, how can you get your master plan in place as well? And so we've been work we, we've been um, doing some support of uh, collaboratives to help states get to a master plan. So ultimately, we want every state in the country to have a master plan for aging. That's Excellent. where we're at. Yeah. Excellent. One thing I just wanted to slip in here real fast, because you, you mentioned something at the beginning, and then I also I was thinking of your um, your work, obviously, at both ends of, of, of life in terms of uh, when we were talking about the, the pediatric care and then, and then the mm -hmm. palliative care. Anything interesting on the, um, you mentioned about the intergenerational front, because th that's been another hot topic that we've gotten into. And, you know, I'd mm -hmm. like to point out my, my mother, you know, May she rest in peace. You know, she got into her, you know, in, in, to 90 and she always said, you know, it was my kids that kept her uh, yeah. young and alive. And, and this and, and, and she taught them so much in return. Any interesting intergenerational uh, programs that uh, you're also working on scan? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly I think, you know, we talked about the caregiving piece yeah. and, and, and that, you know, this becomes very you know, there's an intergenerational component to that. Um, so uh, we we are recognizing that when we're talking about aging, it, it involves all generations. Like in your example, I had my example with my in-laws uh, passing a few years back of cancer, and you know, it it was it was all of us, grandchildren, my children, myself, my husband, everybody coming together, and the community to help um, my my in-laws um, as they were, you know, at the end of life, and. And I think, you know, um, we are, I, I would say that we have an opportunity. So when we do our work now, and we're I just, I, we're actually working on our own strategic re refresh of our strategic plan, we are going to um, bring the voices of the in, uh, other generations into the equation. So we want to change the narrative on aging um, to, to be inclusive of many generations, all generations. Mm -hmm. So because... I, you know, and, and there's some specific, so we have not worked specifically, I should say, on any intergenerational program support, but we are, we are going to be doing more and more in that. Um, and um, an example that I've seen, you know, you've probably, you know, maybe seen in some instances is where um, if you look in it, like an urban area where a kid is going to college and, you know, they can't afford the housing yeah. in the, in, in the, in the community, they are, there are programs now where they can pair Yep. Um, that that college student with an, a, an older adult that happens to also be dealing with social isolation, living alone, maybe, maybe needing some help with their independent activities of daily living, 
and like, you know, even like grocery shopping or paying bills and bringing them together. So there's a win-win, right? That you get the housing, but you also get the support and you get the, 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 the ability for, um, to, to share experiences. I mean, I always say like, there's this, I always feel like there's this thing in, in, in society that older adults are a burden on society when in fact they bring art culture community they pay taxes yep. um and they have wisdom they have experience that they can impart to younger generations and i think similarly younger generations have an ability and they are in a lot of respects you know so, you know having fun enjoying engaging with older adults so i think there's a there's a huge intergenerational approach that we need to address there's an organization called encore that um, i think is just changing its name but they're working on whole mobilization of generations to support uh aging uh, um at the aging process and so i would uh, keep your eye on that one because i think we we, we conceivably will we'll continue to work with them as well we'll start to work with them as well on some issues around no, this. that's uh no it, it's good to hear that there's more organizations that are sort of evolving in this but i think it's a critical importance so now that that's uh i think it's nice that you're bringing that to the uh to the fore yeah. as well so now that's awesome um so anything else coming up for uh, the rest of 2022 into 2023 um conferences that you're going to be speaking at places where uh we can see you meet you possibly um anything else that i missed that you might want to mention per the foundation please uh, take the floor yeah no no absolutely well i would i would just say like a couple of things um you know I think you know I, I kind of go to my back to my journey and in in you know my trajectory and my my career and you know I you know some people have asked me why I've joined a foundation and I think the you know a foundations you know there, there there's a lot we can do in terms of like I said we don't necessarily do all the work on the ground but we can we do can we catalyze these kind of solutions these macro level system changes can we in, you know can we um, engage multiple stakeholders and bring them to the table to define see a problem and solve it um can we can we educate i think there's a lot of education that needs to happen around the fact that we are in a crisis when it comes to supporting the rising demographic of older adults and we're not prepared right so that's another thing and then how do we empower communities um, other in, um, stakeholder advocates to get to the point of being able to affect policy change and programs, or even and the, on the private capital side, how can we support them as they're trying to build products and services um, that provide social good to older adults? So we're trying to realize that's one thing I would like to say is like I think you know we got to be bold, we want to be imaginative, we want to be innovative, um, and so that's one of the things that um, I would say we're we're doing. Um, we're gonna I think. The, the the equity piece, you know, I I I want to clarify like, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, health equity. I've I've seen grave health inequities throughout my my life, you know, my career especially, and you know, kind of talked about my own personal journey, but how it's really driven me to say we got to do more um, mm -hmm. around advancing health equity, and so we're trying to do this through all our work, and it's not just to say we're going to be equitable, but like we have to be actionable. Like, what are the things? even the three to five things that we can work with our constituents on, let's starting in even in California, that will really demonstrate measurable impact around reducing gaps in those in those um, equ inequities. So we're, we're trying to work through that and, and it takes first working with our own organization internally to understand what that means, but also externally um, with, um, multi and we're gonna bring multiple, um, have a whole committee that we bring together to try to advance ec health equity and aging. So I wanna make sure, because I think, um, that piece is something that you know we we don't and we're, we're trying not to do things like reports that sit on a shelf we want to really be actionable in these areas and so you you know i think over the coming months um you're gonna see uh, uh, myself and our foundation speaking um um on on uh, particular I mean, we're going to be attending like for example we're not speaking at it but we're going to be t attending the health conference the hlth conference in in november because there will be a lot of speakers working on innovation tech yeah. health and I think we we want to be, um, you know, say, okay, well, typically a lot of foundations don't come to this meeting, but here we are 
let us let us um, join in this conversation with you on the things I've described. Um, and um, I think there's going to be um, many other um, conferences in, in 2023 where we're going to be um, speaking on policy. We want to do more testimony on the Hill around some of these policies around long-term care, long-term services and support. So more to come, but, um, and we're really excited about, uh, you know, kind of this whole paradigm shift that we want to see in, in aging. You have a lot on your plate. But, we do uh, have a lot. I, <laughs> yeah, I, there's a lot. It's a big, big problems to solve. I mean, these are kind of bold, audacious goals. Um, but we got, and I, we want to, but we want to do the best. I mean, we got to do it. We got to yeah. do it. Uh, again, we're in a. I, I keep on saying this. I hate to say this because it sounds so negative, but we are in a crisis, and yet, and we have opportunity because we have people who want to work together to accomplish uh, these goals. Yeah. That's that's of key importance, and um, yeah. I I'm I'm rooting you on. <laughs> and Thank I, you. I, 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 I'm, I'm so glad we have the opportunity to, to finally get together, and and, and we have the opportunity to profile uh, groups like yours, just because you are at the forefront of this uh, this crisis, and 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 uh, there's someone to solve it. I mean, I'm glad you're leading the uh, uh, the way here. So it, it's very exciting, um, and just you know what we will. We will keep uh, keep watching. Hopefully, we'll do a follow up in a little while uh, on on the different initiatives. Yeah. Um, for everybody that is going to be listening uh, to the episode uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel, uh, again, you've been listening to Dr. Sarita Mahanti. President and Chief Executive Officer, SCAN Foundation. Uh, also check out the uh, uh, California Master Plan for Aging. Uh, while you're at it, we'll put a link to the organization in the bio. Uh, Sweet, I want to thank you for taking uh, the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while about these issues. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there at the SCAN Foundation to make stuff happen. And as we say on our show, Thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for millions of people that need a better tomorrow. Uh, this, this is really a great episode. And, and once again, really appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you for the, all the questions. This has been fantastic. Really appreciate the time today. Great seeing you.